But if you'll stand and join me, uh, we've got a call to worship, and then we're going to praise God. <clears throat> God has called us like Moses in the wilderness, the prophets in the hills, and the disciples in the cities. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Amen.
Let's go to God in prayer. Oh God, we lift up your name on high. You are the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. And you remain faithful forever. You uphold the cause of the oppressed and you give food to the hungry. You set the prisoners free. You give sight to the blind. You lift up those who are bowed down and you love the righteous. Help us love the things you love and go after the things you go after. We pray for your light to shine brightly in our lives so that our light will shine brightly. Help us show compassion and grace towards others in the same way you show us grace and compassion. Forgive us, O oh God, for our failures and sins this week. How we easily say we love you, O oh God, but our actions do not follow many times. How we get caught up in our busy plans and schemes and not putting you first in our lives. Open our spiritual eyes and ears, O oh God, that we may repent and turn from our selfish ways. Merciful Father, help us humble ourselves and cry out for your Holy Spirit to take hold of us and transform us. Break our hearts, O God, that we may be transformed into your image more and more and restore our relationship back to you and to any we might have sinned against. O God, so many people are suffering in this world uh, we particularly pray and lift up those who are suffering in Turkey, in Syria, and Ukraine. They have long roads to recovery. We pray for your divine intervention and healing and that people will come to know you and give their lives to you. Have mercy, O oh God. Also, help the missionaries in that area. Be your hands and feet at this time. Also, help us stay in prayer and support in any way we can in prayer or financial support. We also pray for our international missionaries, Dan and Carol Brown, Dan and Amy Tab, Emily Peace, Dr. Bill and Ann Clemmer. Oh God, we also pray for those who are struggling in mind, body, and spirit. We lift up Margie Bacon's son-in-law to you, oh God. May your healing hands be upon him. We also pray for Margie's daughter. May your healing hands be upon her. There are so many who are suffering, oh God. And we just pray, Lord, that you would be with them, strengthen them, bring forth your peace and comfort, bring forth the hands and feet that will be there to support them as your church. Oh God, we lift up the marriages and families to you. We know that it takes a village to raise up godly people. So help us as a church stay in faithful prayer for our parents and our children. We pray for our husbands and wives that they care for one another with the love of Christ. We pray that fathers and mothers will encourage and edify their children with love and encouragement. We pray for our children that they obey their parents. We pray for our teenagers, our singles, and young adults. We pray for wisdom as they navigate the different things that are happening in their lives. So many things are competing for our time, for our attention. So help us, O oh God, prioritize what is most important to you. And may you bring the fruits of the Spirit into our lives and into our relationships with one another. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. O oh God, we pray that you meet us in these next moments. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. May we rise up and lift up your holy name, the name above all names. And as we worship you, as we hear your word, may we receive your daily bread that will nourish and equip us so that we are ready to go out and live for you. Oh God, we know the devil is always scheming to bring us down. We pray for your protection so that we stay vigilant and spiritually awake through prayer, through your word, and through the fellowship of one another. And, O oh God, we all long for your return. We pray that we remain faithful until that end. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now let us pray the way the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give 
us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand.
Father God, as we look at your word today, help us to just empty ourselves of everything that would put us in the way of serving you. Father, you have given each and every one here a purpose. Father, help us to discover that purpose and to use it for the glory of your kingdom. Father, we thank you for the gifts that have been given today or online to help support the work of this body. Help us to be good stewards and to use them to honor and glorify you. And Father, we pray for the children this morning as they go out to Kids Church. We pray for Sam and Annalise as they lead them, that you would just fill that room with your Holy Spirit, that the children would feel your presence in a way that they've never felt it before. And Father God, we pray for our pastor, and he leads us in your word this morning, that his words would be your words, and moreover, Father, that we would have the ears to listen, the hearts to receive, and the ability to act on those words. We praise and thank you for who you are and for how you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Kids, you may go out to Kids Church. This is a reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 36 through 10, 15. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority, <coughs> excuse me, under, excuse me, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the be <coughs> who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandal or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. This is the true and absolute word of our Lord. Amen. 
So what is your purpose in life? Why are you here? You know, when I was in my early 20s, I felt like my purpose in life was to get a successful career, that that's what life was about. You see, we answer that question, what is our purpose, in different ways, sometimes consciously, but often subconsciously. Do I need to step forward for that feedback or step back? Not sure. All right. Sounds good now. Um, yeah, we answer that question, what is our purpose, uh, consciously or subconsciously? And we answer it subconsciously in how we make our decisions. How do we order our life? What decisions do we make? That is often tells how, what we think our purpose is. And I remember, again, as, as I thought, all right, it's my job to get a, you know, it's my purpose in life to have a successful career. And I was going into international law. That was my goal. That was my purpose. And God broke into my life and sort of revealed to me, so what? If all your dreams come true, if you fulfill that purpose that you think you're meant to fulfill, again, so what? Will it make any difference in the long term? And I realized that, that no, it, it, it wouldn't, that all that purpose was just focused on myself and on a purpose that the culture had kind of given to me, but not a purpose that resonated with why I was created. But the truth and that, that really came to me that day and there was, God reminded me of is, first of all, there is a God. And second of all, that he has a bigger purpose and a bigger calling for each one of us today, that we're called into that purpose so that your career, your marriage, your parenting, your money, your leisure, every day of your life is meant to be connected to that larger purpose. And in our reading today that Mickey read, Jesus sent out a ragtag bunch of 12 ordinary men with an eternal purpose. Now, the context of Mickey's reading, if you were here last week, you know the context, right? One of the good things about going through a book of the Bible as we're going through this series on Matthew is that, well, we go, you know the context because every week we go through it. But for those of you who weren't here, the context is Jesus. He was performing many miracles, and that showed that he had authority over sickness, over the supernatural, over uh, even death. And then he calls all sorts of people to follow him into God's kingdom, even people like Matthew. So remember, Matthew was a tax collector. He was a religious outcast. He was one of those people that most religious people say, yeah, don't, don't come around me. And yet Jesus invites him to be a part of the kingdom. He, so Jesus is inviting all sorts of people into his kingdom, even sinners and tax collectors. But this invitation into the kingdom also meant an invitation into a greater purpose. And Jesus, as we see in our reading, he calls his disciples into his work. And then he gives them power and authority over sickness, over death, over all of the things. And then he entrusts them with a message and he sends them out. You see, we can do that when, when if you have authority over something, then you can delegate that authority. So, you know, leaders, presidents, they will delegate authority to the ambassadors and give them the power and authority to go do things in their name. And that's what Jesus does here. He gives them, his disciples, this mission to go throughout Israel to expand his ministry he invites them into a bigger purpose and gives them a bigger power to do that. And why? Why does he do that? What, pr what prompted Jesus to send them out like this? Well, look at the scripture in Matthew 9, 36. It began when it says Jesus saw the crowds and he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So he has compassion. 
He has compassion for the crowds. And it's not just the crowds that he sees before him, although there's a big crowd before him. He's thinking about the crowds the day before and the day before that, all these crowds that came and they, he, he sees them and he sees their need, a physical need, yes, because they're all, most of them are poor, but also a spiritual need that they had been separated from God. And because of their separation from God, they're not walking in all of God's fullness in his kingdom. And the leaders of Israel make things worse instead of better. And the, uh, Israel's leaders throughout the scriptures are, are referred to as shepherds. And Jesus sees them and they're like, he's like, they don't seem to have a shepherd because their leaders are letting them down. But Jesus comes as the good shepherd and he sees their need and he has compassion on them. His compassion for the people. And that's his purpose in coming was to reconcile people to God and connect them with their eternal purpose that God has given them from the creation of the world. And those people, they're metaphorically called sheep, but they're also metaphorically called a harvest. And God's mission was to bring those people into God's storehouse. But how is he going to do that? How is he going to harvest all of those people? How is he going to bring them all in when there's so many crowds and they're all over the place? Well, he's going to enlist workers. So Jesus says, pray that God would send out workers into the harvest because the need is so great. And so I'm assuming they pray for that for a little bit. Lord, send workers into the harvest. And then their prayers are answered. In chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Jesus called to him his 12 disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So he calls them. They're, they're going to be the ones he sends out. And he gives them authority to do the things that he was doing. And then verse 10, 2 through 4, he, they list, list the 12 uh, disciples. But verse 5, jump to verse 5, it says, These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim... As you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. So Jesus, he has authority. And he gives them power and authority, that same power and authority to his disciples. And the same message, the same miracles that Jesus had just been doing. Remember, if you read Matthew chapter 9, what we did last week... He's doing those things. He's cleansing the lepers. He's casting out demons. He's raising the dead. And he's entrusting his disciples to go perform the same works and give the same message. And notice the message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the message we heard John the Baptist at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew saying, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And then we see Jesus saying that, and when he begins his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, and now he's entrusting that same message to the disciples. It's not their message. It's not their idea. It's God's message of the kingdom so that they are to go and say, the kingdom of, of heaven, it's here. The kingdom of God is here because the king is here. Go follow him. But it's not just their words. He also says, all right, I've invited you into the kingdom. Now you're a, a part of the kingdom. So I also give you the authority to do those kingdom things. So don't just, give me, don't just say the same message. Do the same works. Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Raise the dead. And it's the same for us today that when Jesus calls you to follow him, he gives you his message, his, his power to do those things and a message to share. He calls us into his bigger purpose. Then notice, Jesus tells them, uh, after he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, do what I do. In the ESV, our, our, our scripture reading, it says, you've received without pay, give without pay. But I like the NIV rendering here. It says, freely you've received, freely give. In other words, that Jesus invites all of these people into his kingdom. 
tax collectors, sinners, people that said, oh, they don't deserve to be in the kingdom. And Jesus says, yeah, that's the point. My invitation is free. I'm freely inviting you into the kingdom. I'm freely uh, asking you to be a part of what God is doing. And he's made a way. And then he freely pours upon the disciples, again, tax collectors, fishermen, the kingdom power to go and heal the sick. And he, so he's saying, I, you didn't earn this. I chose you. I've called you freely. Now it's not so that you'll be great. It's not so that you'll have the power, but so that you will pass it on. I've freely given to you. I've freely invited you into the kingdom. Now you freely go invite others and freely give what you've received to others because this purpose is bigger than you. It's a purpose of the purposes of God. And so he sends out these 12 disciples. In other places, they're called apostles. So disciples, that word disciple comes from the word learner or follower. The word apostle is, comes from the word sent out. It literally means sent out one. That's why some of these 12 apostles are referred to as apostles. Sometimes they're disciples. And some of them are more well-known. You've heard of Peter. You've heard of John. But then there's others that you might not have heard much about, like Bartholomew and Thaddeus. But they're all sent out so that Jesus' ministry can reach more people. Because when the Son of God took on human flesh, right, he can represent us to God, right? He can be a sacrifice for humanity. But what that also means is that he voluntarily takes on physical limitations when he's in the flesh. So he entrusts these 12 with his power and his authority to expand his ministry throughout the land of Israel. They have received freely from Jesus, and now they're to pass it on to others. All right, I don't have too much time for lots of chasing rabbits, but I want to chase a, a small rabbit or go on a small rabbit trail because... Although this passage isn't about leadership, I think Jesus gives some really good principles of leadership here. Because good leaders entrust and raise up other people so that the mission can expand. See, many people think that being a leader is, is being an expert in a certain thing or, or, or being skilled at something better than other people. But no, that makes you knowledgeable, that makes you skillful, but it doesn't make you a leader. Because a leader builds up other people and wants to expand what's going on. And so, for instance, Jesus, was he a better teacher than the 12 apostles? Was Jesus a better teacher? Yeah, of course he was. Was Jesus a better healer than the 12 apostles? Was he a better, uh, could he prophesy better? Could he pray better? He could do all of these things better than the 12, and yet he entrusts the 12 to go do that. Why? Because he's also a leader, and he understands that good leading is raising up other people. See, churches and Christians mistakenly think that becoming good at something is the goal of leadership, or helping other people become, or, you know, you becoming an expert in those things. No, a good leader raises up people so that they can join in the mission, join in the purpose, and be skilled in that. All right, so now we're going to go back off that little rabbit trail. We're going to go back onto our main trail here of the scripture. But it's just a, a, an amazing principle that I think Jesus points out. But notice here that in the scripture reading, it said, Jesus says, just go to Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Just go to the lost sheep of Israel. Well, why does he say that? Well, as Jesus, uh, Jesus is Israel's promised Messiah. And so his first priority is to God's covenant people. And Jesus' ministry, it's specific to, this, to Israel at this point. Because remember, how in, in, in 936, he has compassion, right? Why does he have compassion? He sees the people of Israel without a shepherd. And, and so he's sending them out specifically to the people of Israel because the harvest in Israel right now in Jesus' ministry is the priority. Now, eventually, it'll go worldwide. The mission and purpose is to bring God's purposes worldwide. But at this point, the priority is Israel. 
And that's why he also, that explains the rest of it, where he says, go uh, acquire no gold or silver or, or anything for the journey. You just basically go, don't even take two tunics, right? So don't even take like two outer garments. Just take one, just take one staff. Don't take any, just go. Freely you've received, freely give. And, and so this points to the, that the 12 have an urgency for the message uh, to Israel, and so, no, there's no preparation. There's no long-term plan. There's no long-term sowing and watering. It's just, it's, it's the harvest. And so bring in the harvest. Bring in the people of God and specific to that time. And so then we ask, okay, because some of you might be thinking, all right, well, so does that, you know, how do we apply that part? Does that mean, you know, when, when we go out, we, we don't take any, any, uh, in, any staff or two tunics and, you know, I've got an extra coat here. Should I leave that at home? A sort of a, a, a principle of uh, interpretation is certain parts of the Bible are descriptive and certain are prescriptive, right? So many things in the Bible are described and we have to decide or, or, or discern, all right, does that, how does that apply to our life today? Because certain things are prescriptive, certain things are descriptive. So, for instance, when uh, in the Old Testament it describes, um, you know, Abraham sort of selling his, his wife uh, to, the, to the Egyptian pharaoh, not literally selling her, but saying, hey, it's, it's okay if you take her as wife. She's not really my wife. She's my sister. That's descriptive. That's not saying you should do that, right? Um, this, in this example, we have a, a very specific time in salvation history where it describes the specific ministry of the 12. And you're like, well, Pastor Joe, how do you, why do you say that? Well, when you read the rest of the Bible, we see that no longer is the mission just to the people of Israel, it's to the whole world. That's one of the clues that we can discern. Okay, this is kind of specific because later, even in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. So now the purposes of God have expanded. The, the purposes of um, calling people into his kingdom have expanded. And that's why then there's more long-term mission planning. Uh, the Apostle Paul tells Titus, go and appoint overseers in the churches. So it's not just harvest time. There's planting and sowing and all of these things going on because God's purposes and his plan is going global. But again, that, that primary thrust of the scripture is you've received freely, now give freely. The kingdom is here. And so Jesus is inviting each one of us into his kingdom, into the larger purposes of God. And then he's saying, and if once you've come into that kingdom, now you go and share that. Freely you've received, freely give. So that comes back to what's, what is our purpose? You know, what is our purpose in life? Why are you here? And there's competing visions for our life. There's many people and many things in our culture that will try to tell us what our purpose is, especially in our, as our culture goes more and more secular and, and, and um, away from God. There's the only thing that's left are purposes such as, all right, well, there's not really a heaven, there's not really a God, so kind of make as much heaven on earth as you can. In other words, your life, the purpose of life is to make yourself comfortable, try to, try to expand pleasure, maybe have a nice restful retirement, because that's basically all you're going to get. That's basically all you can hope for. Right? That's one of the messages that our culture gives us. That's what our purpose is. Or, you know, be the best version of yourself. Well, we have to ask, well, who defines best? And even then, what a small purpose to be the best, best version of myself? That's it? No, but see, this is where Jesus, he freely calls us. He invites us into his larger kingdom and his larger plan and says, no, you've actually been created for a purpose. Your creator has made you and he wants to be a part of what he's doing eternally. So it's not just about what can I do these 80 years of my life if we're blessed with that long. 
but rather God has an eternal plan and purpose and he invites us into that. And then he gives us that mission to then you freely received, freely give it. That God has poured out his forgiveness upon us so we enjoy that. We, we're now a part of God's kingdom. And now we enjoy his presence and his power in our lives now. And he says, all right, not only are you going to have that now, but then that's going to stretch into an eternity. And you're even just getting a taste of it now because no eye has seen or ear has heard the wonderful things that God has in store for us. And it starts now, but then it extends. And God says, I've freely given that to you. It's nothing you deserve, but I've poured my grace and mercy upon you. And now go and spread that. What you freely received, freely give. And so you might think, okay, does that mean I, I should be like this, you know, apostles, no money, no nothing, just pre preaching, casting out demons? Well, again, what did God do? He's, he's expanded the ministry. It's not just go to Israel for these next few weeks because Jesus is walking the earth and they need to meet Jesus in the flesh while they can. No, Jesus has risen from the dead and now he's poured out his spirit and God's kingdom is meant to go into every area of the world. So that for most of us, now some of us are called to go and um, do itinerant ministry and, and different things. But for the most part, what this means is that instead of forsaking work and wandering around expecting people to feed us, we bring God's bigger purpose into our work, into our families, into our neighborhoods, into our leisure, into our finances, into all of our relationships. All of these areas of our life are meant to be infused with the bigger purposes of God, and they can be. And not just in word. Yes, we go and we share this message of God's love, but it's also in how we do things, in word and deed. We reflect Jesus' power and his authority over our lives and in every area of life. So, for instance, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, the Apostle Paul saying to the church at Colossus, he says, whatever you do, whatever you do, parenting, marriage, finances, work, leisure, do whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Doing everything in the name. What does the in the name mean? It doesn't just mean I'm saying Jesus all the time as I do these things. No, it means in the name means you would do something in the name of the king. That meant I'm representing the king right now, so I'm going to give this message in his name. I'm going to do this in his name. It means doing what Jesus would do and reflecting him in how we do it in every area of life because the kingdom and the king is meant to go into every area of our lives, every area of our world. That's why he says the, the harvest is so big, but the workers are few. Now the harvest isn't just Israel, it's all over the world. So the person at work, your neighbor, all of those people are meant to be presented with the goodness of Jesus in thought, word, and deed. And who is Jesus called to do that? You and me. He's given us, freely given us of his kingdom, and he says, now I want my purposes to invade your life and to pour out into every place you go. And so what does that look like? Well, it looks like doing word, deed, everything we do, we reflect Jesus' character in his spirit in everything we do, how we do it with compassion, love, building up others, uh, forgiveness, kindness. We receive those things, we give those things. It also means everything we do, we are to do it in an excellent way because we are representing Jesus. So if you're a waitress, be the best waitress you can be. If you're a police officer, you be the best police officer you can be. If you're a CEO, you be the best CEO you can be because you're not just doing it for you, you're doing it for the purposes of God. And so that God and the king is invading everything we do. So what is this, so you make me think, well, what does that look like? Has this ever happened before? Here's an illustration. An illustration of this is World War II. All right, in, in World War II, every person had a, to play a role in the larger efforts, right, for the bigger purpose. We think about the soldiers fighting on the front lines, 
But they weren't the only ones involved. Uh, put up that poster, that World War II poster. I think this is a British poster where it talked about everyone. Oh, you're, you're a housewife in London? You can do things. Your everyday things that you do, cooking, collecting trash, it can be a part of a larger purpose, the, the, the purpose of winning victory. So collect your scraps, collect your tin, collect your, the, uh, the um, what do you call those cloth things? Uh, rags, right? The, the, the cloth and the, and the rags, because these things can be used in the larger war effort. And everyone was involved because they knew there's a purpose beyond myself and I'm a part of it. So too are, is, is the kingdom of God. Everything we do, how we cook, how we relate to our spouse, everything. You know, the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. And the context of that is, is, the, where is World War II. That the Pepinzi family, the reason that they're up there running around in wardrobes and stuff is that people who lived north of, of London, they opened their homes to, to children from London because the London bombings were going on. They said, no, my home is not just for me. It's for the bigger purpose. Everything we do, same with us, everything we do is meant to be infused with the bigger purposes of God. Because the good news is global. He's sending us out with his power and his authority. So not only is the good news to be shared, we've freely given, we're to freely, excuse me, we've re freely received it, we're to freely give it. But now it's not just like, all right, Jesus says, all right, go out, you know, live out my purposes, live out my kingdom. Just, yeah, just try as hard as you can. No, he gives us his power, right? He gave the disciples power over the, over the, the spirits and, and he, the, so they could heal so too, God gives us his spirit so that we can do those things that we can't do on our own, that we can exp expand, the ki expand the kingdom in ways that we didn't think possible because they're not possible in our own strength, but they're possible because Jesus the King says, I'm giving you my purposes, I'm giving you my power to go and spread the kingdom good news. So will you do that today? First, if you've never said yes to God's kingdom, if you've never said yes to Jesus, Jesus, you are my king, you are my savior, that's what you need to do today because he wants to pour out upon you his forgiveness, his goodness, his love, and then receive that fully. And in other words, just receive his spirit, just drink deeply of the grace and goodness of God. And then if you've done that, then... Jesus, okay, I've given you freely, now you freely give. And infuse your life with his purposes and his power. Let's pray. Dear God, we are so grateful for your grace and mercy. We're so grateful that you call us to a kingdom bigger than, than our own. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness for the ways that we have lived for other purposes, such small purposes, God. And we're thankful that you call us into your kingdom, your purposes, your goodness. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd move about this sanctuary. You would work in our hearts and online, Lord. You would be calling people to yourself. Just as you called Matthew, the tax collector, and other sinners, you call us to yourself. Lord, may we respond now. And Lord, show us, each person here, whether they're a waitress or a police officer, whatever they are, Lord, um, I pray that you would show us how we can live out your purposes in our careers, but also, Lord, how we, uh, um, in our marriages, in our families. And so, Lord, speak to each one of us. Call us into your purpose. And Lord, we need your power. And so we also take you up on your gracious gift of the power to do, live beyond ourselves. Pour out your spirit now, Lord, so that we can do those things that you've called us to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So now as we, th this is the first Sunday of March, and so we also are, are going to observe the Lord's Supper today. So if you would, hopefully you were given um, a, a small thing, a, a wafer and a cup when you came in. And as you're getting that ready, just a reminder that what we do with the Lord's Supper is we take the bread and the cup and it's, it reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice. Um, and it's, Jesus told us to do these things so that we would remember that because of his broken body, his shed blood, we now have access into the kingdom. That anything that, would, that came in between us and God, Jesus has taken away as far as the east is from the west. And because of that, we can enter that kingdom. Because of that, Jesus says to anyone, you can come into my kingdom because I've already done all the work for you. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're remembering, oh, he has freely given us. And then from that, we can go and, and freely give to others. So the Apostle Paul uh, to the church in Corinth in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul's teaching the churches as he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take the bread, eat in remembrance of Jesus' broken body. Then we read in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We take the cup and drink it in remembrance of Jesus' shed blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we've taken the bread and the cup, and we are so grateful for your sacrifice. Your sacrifice makes all things possible, God. Because of your broken body and shed blood, we can enter your kingdom, we can receive your spirit and your power, and that's not just for this world, but it's forever, for eternity. So we remember your broken body and shed blood, and we rejoice, Lord, of your, in your grace and your mercy, a purpose beyond ourselves. And Lord, as we've re freely received all of your goodness, we pray we would go out and share that with others. We've, re we've freely received, oh Lord, we pray we'd freely give. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you please stand as we sing our last song?
that is, that's it right there, just what we sang. Go and give freely, and, and because you believe, because you've received that, now we go in the purposes of God. He's freely given us, and now we freely give all that he gave to us, expanding his kingdom into our homes, into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, and bringing God's grace and mercy to everywhere we go. Go in peace.